and the very last venture is by President Malcolm Levitt that looks forward. So, yes. Yes. <coughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, a 
orphan home, a free orphan home for white boys in Philadelphia. And he also came to know something about the Cooper Institute in New York City. The Cooper Institute, founded by Peter Cooper, was a co-educational institution that had uh, essentially engineering mechanical type instruction for men and art and music for women. Now, he doesn't, we don't know where he learned about these two institutions. It may have been that he was attracted more with the founders because both Stephen and Gerard, Stephen and Gerard and Peter Cooper were, in some sense, men of the world, not academicians. And he may have been attracted by their biographies more than by what they actually counted. But we do know he knew something about the Gerard Institute, free for the white boys of Philadelphia, and the Cooper Institute, co-educational academic institution. Sometime in the early, 18, uh, in the early 1880s, it appears that he, uh, not he, he thought about using some of his money to establish on his property in New Jersey an orphan's home. And except for an interesting twist of history, <coughs> William Marsh Rice might be known as the founder of a free orphan's home in New Jersey. But sometime in the mid-1880s, while visiting Houston, staying in the hotel he owned on what is now the side of the Rice Hotel, <coughs> one of his, his old friends a visit him. This friend had been a president of the school board in Houston. And in the 1880s, Houston did not yet have a public high school. And uh, the town officials thought it was quote, a highfalutin idea even to have a high school. But Amanda Raphael believed that there should be a high school. And he came and asked Mr. Lo Mr. Uh, Rice, since he had really made his fortune in Houston and had no children, would it be appropriate if, for prosperity, he left posterity. He left a public building for a high school in Houston. Uh, Mr. Rice said he would think about it. And I'm certain that when Raphael left, he thought, well, nothing's ever happened to that idea. Because Mr. Rice was not the kind of person apparently who made snap judgments. However, five years later, uh, in the spring, Mr. Rice came back to Houston again, his, doing his periodic checkup on his investments and so forth. And he called six of his best friends, including Armando Raphael, uh, and his law a man known his name as Captain Jones, James Baker. Captain Baker because he was a member of the honorary horse floor, not really in the military position. But he called him down to his hotel room in the Rice Hotel. This is in, in the spring of 1891. And he said he ought to have been thinking about this suggestion made by the years earlier that he had now or he built a public high school city of Houston building. And he, but he had changed his mind. He had decided to establish what he called, and he had a charter with him to establish the William Marsh Rice Institute for the Advancement of Literature, Science, and Art. Later, if you look at the ring of the Rice seal, literature has changed the letter because it was too long to flex on that one. But it was the William Marsh Rice Institute for the Advancement literature, science, and art. And uh, I'm sure these six would-be trustees who were called out when they read that document, they were nonplussed because the document is extraordinarily vague. I mean, you, you think it's going to be some great, noble document on you know, beautiful paper and so forth. It's just typed, and it, it doesn't look like much. And, it, and actually, when you read it, it doesn't sound like much because the word college or university is not in that charter. And it seems to be a, just kind of a mishmash of ideas that talks about a free public library. It talks about uh, uh, laboratory uh, equipment. It talks about uh, art and sculpture. It has the phrase polytechnic instruction. Uh, I mean, you, you read that document, and really, you cannot tell exactly what it was that Mr. Rice had in mind, except that he does say that it will be free for the white young men and women of Harris County in Texas. And so, you know, you think he gets that idea of free from the Gerard Institute and that the co-educational nature. I mean, co-educational seems obvious to us, but a co-educational institution was quite unusual in 1891. So here's this charter that's established, extremely vague. It doesn't really say exactly what it's supposed to be. It doesn't really have, it doesn't denote any powerful ambition of what he aspired for this institution to be. And it says that uh, basically that it's free and it's co-educational and nothing is to be done until he's dead. And I always have a feeling when the trustees read that document, they must have kind of heaved a sigh of relief that nothing, relief, that nothing
what was the appropriate thing to do. So Mr. Rice, after he puts up a promissory note of $200,000, and this charter is filed in Austin, and some sort of a paper institute exists, well, a little office downtown, no faculty, no president, no, no, no apparent purpose. Mr. Rice goes back to New York. He, this time he's retired to New York. His wife is dead, and he's living in an apartment house in Madison Avenue. And he had employed on one of his trips to Houston a young Houstonian named Charles Jones to be his sort of valet, cook, so my grocery part to take care of himself. And uh, in a very long, complicated story that I want to get into, Mr. Rice is, uh, had begun to uh, have a somewhat of a squabble about his second wife's will. Uh, and, a, and a corrupt lawyer who had originally been hired to be involved in uh, determining the consequences of the second of Mrs. Rice's will, clearly hatched a plot to learn how to fake Mr. Rice's signature. And this lawyer, Albert Patrick, wrote a new will, giving essentially all the money to himself and to Charlie Jones. And then they proceeded to try to get Mr. Rice to die. I mean, it gave him all kinds of funny things to eat and hot medicine and so forth. Mr. Rice seemed to have a really hearty constitution. I have to say that now it's not absolutely clear that in fact he was murdered, although it does seem clear that Charlie Jones intended to murder him. But we do know that uh, shortly after uh, this great uh, new uh, Gallatin hurricane, September 1901. That hurricane didn't just, of course, demolish Galveston, it caused damage on the mound. And one of the things that damaged was Mr. Rice's uh, cottonseed oil mill. And so quickly after he got word that his cottonseed oil mill was uh, damaged, he authorized the spending of some of his cash to begin rebuilding that cottonseed oil mill. And the lawyer, the corrupt lawyer, and Charlie Jones, who were hoping Mr. Rice would die and they would get his money, they saw his most fluid assets quickly being drained out to, re to rebuild this cottonseed oil mill. So they sort of lost patience with him, wanting to die of you know, eating too many bananas and pills <coughs> and so forth. And so it, apparently they concocted a plot to actually kill him with uh, chloroform. And uh, a little column of chloroform in place of his nose. Uh, and he was apparently smothered to death or killed by breathing the chloroform. I say apparently because late, later on we'll mention that an autopsy is done, but autopsy, autopsies were just simply not scientific enough in 1900 to prove beyond a shadow of doubt that this is what killed him. I mean, he could have died of a heart attack just before they began to uh, smother I mean, I think that's unlikely. I think, in fact, they did kill him with chloroform. What we do know is that they had a plot. They had the fake will, and they had intended for him to die. And so he did die on, September, on Sunday, September 23, 1900, just a couple of weeks after the great Galveston hurricane. Now, the, the lawyer, Albert Packard, was, could not wait until everything be probated. So he had had Charlie Jones write a check to Albert Packard for $25,000 so he could instantly get some money. And so Monday, just the day after Mr. Rice had died or had been murdered, Albert Patrick went to the bank to cash this $25,000 check that Charlie Jones had written out. Charlie Jones had always written out Mr. Rice's checks, and then, but in this case, he wrote it out. And Albert Patrick, had, who had learned to sign Mr. Rice's name, had signed Mr. Rice's name. But $25,000 was a lot of money in 1900. Now, of course, it's like what a basketball player makes in you know, 30 seconds, but it's a lot of money in 19, 1900. So the bank clerk looked at that check quite carefully, and he noticed that on the back of the check, Albert Patrick had signed his name, Albert Patrick. But on the front of the check, Mr. Jones, in his nervousness or his greed, had left the hell out of Albert. So it said on the front of the check, pay the order of Albert Patrick. And on the back, it was kind of signed Albert Patrick. The bank clerk noticed that discrepancy, said he should check, took it back to show it to a higher bank officer. They thought that, in fact, was suspicious. They determined that they should call Mr. Rice's apartment to this okay to cash the check, whereupon they learned that Mr. Rice had just died, had died the previous day. The bank then telegraphed, <coughs> refused to cash the check, telegraphed Mr. Rice's lawyer in Houston, Captain James Baker, and said that Mr. 
Mr. Wright had died in the previous day <coughs> under suspicious circumstances. Captain Baker got on the train, went to New York, began an investigation. Uh, they began to pressure both Charlie Johnson, the lawyer. Charlie Johnson, sort of simple-minded valet, confessed, gave state's evidence that the lawyer had copied this plot and they had killed Mr. Wright by chloroforming to death to get his money. After a sensational trial, the headline 